Hi, uh, welcome to this uh, set of four lectures on uh, Marx's philosophy, politics, and economics. My name is Nicholas Rosales. I teach uh, philosophy at Erasmus University, Rotterdam. This lecture course is mainly for uh, the Free University of Amsterdam History of Philosophy, uh, PPE undergrads. So let's delve into it. These four lectures are meant to introduce you to the thought of Karl Marx, including his philosophy, politics, and economics. Uh, first, we'll uh, discuss, today we'll discuss the proceedings of this course, and then I'll try to give you a broad overview of uh, the themes we'll be looking at in these lectures. In the second lecture, we'll delve straight into the texts themselves. So we will study the works of the early Marx with emphasis on the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844 and the comments on James Mill. In the, second, in the third lecture, we'll look at Marx's reaction to his earlier writings, his break with Hegel and the beginning of his materialism. Uh, we will read the Communist Manifesto and the famous preface to his contribution to the critique of political economy. And uh, these works written between 1848 and 1859 effectively signify the beginning of Marx's engagement with English political economy. In the fourth and final lecture, we will discuss parts of Marx's Opus Magnum, uh, Volume 1, of Capital, which is the culmination of Marx's engagement with political economy and a major work of, of synthesis of politics, philosophy, and economics. Uh, I think it is also one of the masterpieces of 19th century uh, political thought. You will be expected to read the primary literature as spelled out in the course outline. The course outline on Canvas. I, I also recommend that you look for the primary texts online under Marx Engels Collected Works, abbreviated MECW, uh, followed by volume number. These volumes are all available in PDF online, but if you can't find a particular volume, then you can use uh, the site www.marxist.org as a last resort. I say as last resort because the uh, MECW translations are almost invariably better. If you'd rather buy one of the texts we'll be using, then you should probably buy David McClellan's uh, Karl Marx selected writings. So in terms of secondary literature, uh, an excellent introduction to uh, the German philosophy background is uh, Avineri's uh, The Social and Political Thought of Karl Marx. Uh, for historical materialism, I think by far the most influential text of the latter half of the 20th century is uh, Jerry Cohen's Karl Marx's Theory of History and Defense. For English political economy, you can read the, the essay uh, Adam's Fallacy by Duncan Foley. And his essay, Understanding Capital, is also very handy, very good. For the more mathematically inclined, Romer's Free to Lose is a good entry point into the intricacies of Marxian economics. And for French socialism, you can check out Engels' uh, Socialism, Utopian and Scientific. And the essay by David McNally on Proudhon uh, in Against the Market is also very good. Um, in terms of assessment, because uh, assessment must regrettably take place, uh, you will be assessed by a 1,200-word essay along with the final exam for the whole History of Philosophy course. To prepare for your essay, I ask that you submit a 500-word proposal to me uh, by the 27th of April. Please check the course outline for deadlines in case these change in the meantime. 
uh, and then I will give you some feedback on the proposal. The final deadline for your essay is the 4th of May. It's due through Turnitin on Canvas. So let's get to it. Marx's philosophical development can be conveniently broken down into three component parts. Uh, the early Marx, 1843 to 45, which develops a philosophical materialism and also philosophical anthropology and a theory of human nature and human flourishing. There's a middle period that we'll talk about where Marx develops his materialist theory of history between 46, 45, 46, and 1859, 1857, 1859. You know. Uh, People differ on these dates. And then finally, the late Marx were from 1857 to 1883, Marx developed his critique of political economy. This is completely artificial um, and does not imply any deep division in Marx's work. Uh, in the 1970s, it was fashionable to advocate the idea of an epistem so called epistemological break between the work of the uh, 1844 Marx and the 1846-47 Marx, uh, and so kind of humanism versus materialism. Uh, this was largely due to the influence of French Marxism, especially Louis Althusser, but there is no, I think, evidence of such a break in Marxist thought, and in fact, as we will see, there is a remarkable degree of continuity between his early, middle, and late periods. So, first, the early Marx. Uh, Marx was educated in classics and philosophy in Bonn and Berlin, and although his uh, doctoral thesis was on ancient Greek philosophy, the philosophical air he lived and breathed was that of Hegel. Uh, Hegel's philosophy had a strong impact on the German intellectual climate, and Marx was very quickly attracted to a leftist current within Hegelianism. He joined that current of the self-styled self -styled young Hegelians uh, and quickly became one of its spokesmen. He later broke with them, but uh, I think their influence can still be felt throughout his work. Hegel believed that God manifests himself in the human world by developing human essence through what he called the idea, capital I, idea. Societies grow and prosper, according to Hegel, and then shrink and die in proportion to their ability to develop that idea. Each civilization has its part in developing it, first the Egyptians, then the Greeks and Romans, then early Christianity, and then in Hegel's time, Lutheranism. Uh, schematically, it can be useful to think of Hegel as believing that uh, God makes humanity. The young Hegelians wanted to extract the rational kernel out of Hegel's theory without affirming the existence of uh, mythological entities like the Christian God. The foremost defender of this view, whose work exerted a lifetime uh, influence on Marx's thought, was Ludwig Feuerbach. Feuerbach published a book in 1841 entitled The Essence of Christianity. In that book, Feuerbach proposed that human emancipation begins from criticism of the secularized religions of Kant and Hegel, and more precisely, it involves an inversion uh, of the Hegelian subject predicate structure. So, Warbeck proposed that Hegel's philosophy gets things the wrong way around. Instead of God making humanity, enlightened thought sees that humanity makes God. So, according to Warbeck, it is not God. Uh, who makes himself manifest in the world through the, through the idea or other mysterious entities like that. It is rather humanity that creates images of herself and projects them into the sphere of the mythical. 
In short, it is humanity that alienates herself into a higher plane of existence, not God who alienates himself into a lower plane. And this thought is very simple, uh, but also very influential. Freud later completely naturalized that thought in civilization and its discontents. Um, Forbach's inversion of the Hegelian subject revolutionized Marx's thought. A large part of Marx's research, I think, until the mid-1840s, uh, which is when his total break with the young Hegelians occurs, consists in trying to explain Feuerbach's inversion. As you will see by the end of this course, the inversion idea survives well into the later writings, including his critique of political economy. Um, what you get there is something like Feuerbach's inversion. So that is, instead of in Marx, this inversion, instead of going from humanity controlling machines, which is the humanized way of producing, what Marx calls the associated mode of production, capitalism creates an inverted world in which machines control humanity. Uh, movie dystopias like uh, uh, The Matrix uh, and The Terminator immediately come to mind. These dystopias can easily be read as variations on the Feuerbachian inversion motif. And we'll come back to this. Marx initially accepted the young Hegelian critique of religion, uh, along with their critique of Kant's and Hegel's attempts to extract the rational content from rational belief, from religious belief. And in Marx's early writings especially, this criticism takes a particularly intransigent form. In his contribution to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, Marx writes, religious suffering is at one and the same time the expression of real suffering and a protest against real suffering. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. This passage is sometimes read as implying that religion is a kind of ruling class ploy intended to manipulate the workers. But Marx meant no such thing. Religion for Marx is a spontaneously emerging consolation for suffering. So he writes, the abolition of religion as the illusory happiness of the people is the demand for their real happiness. To call on them to give up their illusions about their condition is to call on them to give up a condition that needs illusions. From which it follows that criticism, the kind of criticism that the young Hegelians provide, has plucked the imaginary flowers on the chain not in order that man shall continue to bear that chain without fantasy or consolation, but so that, so that he shall throw off the chain and pluck the living flower. Marx takes this image uh, of the flowers from the chain, from Rousseau. The flowers are religion. The chain is real concrete servitude. What the young Hegelians have done, Marx says, is that they have enabled humanity to pluck these flowers from the chain, so that she may throw off the chain and realize herself in the world. These thoughts eventually led Marx to break with the young Hegelians. Um, and in the thesis on Forbach, Marx writes, uh, Forbach starts from the fact of religious self-alienation, of the duplication of the world into a religious world and a secular one. His work consists in resolving the religious world into its secular basis, but that the secular basis detaches itself from itself and establishes itself as an independent realm in the clouds can only be explained by the cleavages and self-contradictions within the secular basis. The latter must therefore in itself be both understood in its contradiction and revolutionized in practice. That the secular world is itself contradictory itself wrought with incompatible and competing material tendencies becomes the basis for Marx's work after 1845. 
including his theory of historical materialism. Um, so, in the mid 1840s, Marx attempts to settle his scores with the German philosophical tradition. He begins to look for a materialist explanation for uh, for the philosophical anthropology he espoused in his early writings. So this includes both a philosophical materialism, uh, which rejects the secularized uh, religion found in, in Hegel and Kant, sometimes not that secularized in fact, uh, and the historical materialism, which is an attempt to provide a new explanation for epochal change. So here's a, a pamphlet that Marx published slightly, uh, a little bit after the 1848 revolutions in Europe, um, entitled Wage, Labor and Capital, and which offers a, an illuminating analogy and illustration of his views. Uh, so Marx writes, um, with the invention of a new instrument of warfare, firearms, uh, the whole internal organization of the army necessarily changed. The relationship within which individuals can constitute an army and act as an army were transformed and the relations of different armies to one another also changed. Um, so the analogy is complete if you replace replace instrument of production for instrument of warfare and replace society for army. Uh, and then you get the desired result. Changes in the availability and structure of the forces of production change the relations between individuals, both Vert, both vertically and horizontally. But I think there are two ways to read the analogy. There's a narrow and a broad reading, if you like. Uh, on the narrow reading, the passage implies that social relations are explained by the growth or development of the productive forces and human productive powers, the instruments of production, if you like, uh, not the, the idea, as in Hegel where these forces are construed as technology and human knowledge, so quite narrowly. On a broader reading, the explanation for social change is not, for social change is not this dialectic of contradiction between narrowly construed uh, productive forces in relations of production, but rather between the wherewithal for universal self-realization and the existing social uh, relations of social power, social relations of production, as Marx calls it. Capitalism, for example, is the only social system hitherto that enables universal self-realization and simultaneously restricts it to a small proportion of society, to the 1%. We will discuss these different ways of thinking about historical materialism in Lecture 3. I turn now to the late Marx. Some of you will know of Bernard de Mandeville, uh, who was born in Rotterdam and studied in Leiden. Mandeville uh, published a, an essay in 1714 entitled The Fable of the Bees. Um, and it, its subtitle was um, uh, private vices, uh, public benefits. And Mandeville, Mandeville's doctrine encapsulated the idea that the free interactions of individuals produces not chaos, but an orderly pattern that is logically determined and normally um, socially beneficial. This orderly pattern is produced by effectively the greed of the individual uh, agents. So 
Mandeville, in effect, anticipates the doctrine of Smith's own unseen hand uh, or invisible hand. And the idea was revolutionary because it broke with a natural law doctrine which associated economic value with justice or fair price. Uh, and that idea found eloquent expression and defense in Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, possibly the founding text of political economy. Those of you who are interested in economics will know that economist after economist has proven theorem after theorem, trying to show how the invisible hand works and why it is so salutary to uh, social interactions among large number, large numbers of agents. Smith's book was published in 1776, the same year as the uh, U.S. Declaration of Independence. And uh, its significance, I mentioned this because its significance cannot be underestimated. Uh, it's one of the uh, momentous publications and philosophical developments of the 18th century. Smith was influenced and in turn influenced the rising tide of 18th century economic liberalism and like his predecessors, the French physiocrats, he believed that the pursuit of unimpeded individual self-interest subject to uh, institutional safeguards can lead to the maximization of human happiness. Smith, whom Marx called the Luther of political economy, uh, Luther presumably because, you know, Luther emancipated Christianity from the church, so uh, Smith emancipated political economy from natural law. So, Smith sought to provide an anatomy for this phenomenon of uh, private vices and public virtues. Um, what most people know about the connection between Smith and Mandeville issues from Smith's well-known aphorism that it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner but from their regard for their own self-interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love and never talk to them of their own necessities, but their advantages. Smith follows Mandeville and the French physiocrats in the belief that the existence and use of the economic surplus presupposes a market where individuals can freely express their preferences and sort of vote for goods on the basis of ability to pay. How does this work? Well, in the world of nations, Smith distinguishes between market price and what he calls natural price. The former is, he says, regulated by the quantity which is actually brought to the market and the demand of those who may be called the effectual demanders, just demand and supply. But natural price, says Smith, is as it were the, the central price to which all pro, to which the prices of all commodities are continually gravitating. Note the reference to gravitating. This is the influence of um, 18th century physics on the rising social sciences of the 18th century. Smith defines the natural price of a good as the sum of the natural values of rent profit and wages. And he says that market competition is said to have a tendency to swiftly equate market with natural price. It follows that direct taxes and quotas and other restrictions or limitations on um, the market mechanism will tend to raise market prices above their natural level, thereby harming the consumers and uh, also what Smith calls the public opulence, common good. The seeds of, common, of uh, economic liberalism, which coincide with the rise of the Industrial Revolution in Britain, I think can be found in this doctrine. Now, Smith 
alludes to an early and rude state of society which precedes both the accumulation of stock and the appropriation of land, where the whole produce of the labor belongs to the laborer, and the quantity of labor commonly employed in acquiring or producing any commodity is the only circumstance which can regulate the quantity of labor which it ought commonly to purchase, command, or exchange for. In this state of affairs, says Smith, the proportion between the quantities of labor necessary for acquiring different objects will be, he says, the only circumstance which can, which can afford any rule for exchanging them for another, for one another. This is very important for, I think, understanding the background against which Marx develops his, his critique of political economy, because it's about the theory of value. In preparation for lectures three and four, consider Smith's parable of the deer hunter and the beaver hunter. Here's Smith. It usually costs twice the labor to kill a beaver, which it costs to kill a deer. One beaver should naturally exchange for four or be worth two deer. It is natural that what is usually the produce of two days or two hours is labor should be worth double of what is usually the produce of one day's or one hour's labor. So here's a simple model for understanding this and thinking about this. Suppose that L is the amount of labor necessary to kill a deer and 2L the amount of labor necessary to kill a beaver. PD is the price of deer, market price of deer, and PB is the market price of beavers. So what happens is the question if PD is equal to PB. Uh, is this an equilibrium price? Well, you should work it out. You, you are, um, should be capable of working it out. But here is Smith's answer. So this isn't an equilibrium price because if PD equals PB, then given different costs of production. It pays to kill more deer, which is less difficult, less costly, and sell it at the same price as beavers. But this will drive down the relative price of deer uh, until it's equal to the relative cost of production, so L over 2L, so half. So market conditions in this early and rude state ensure that relative prices are proportional to relative labor costs. This is sometimes called the labor theory of value. And uh, it is the theory that was later taken up in the early 1800s by David Ricardo and further developed by Ricardo. Ricardo was a, was a British economist and businessman who, who uh, developed these ideas in his uh, principles of political economy and taxation. And crucially, Ricardo was also one of the principal defenders of free trade in Britain at the height of the growth of the British Empire. Ricardo picks up where Smith leaves off. So Smith had recognized the centrality of distribution to political economy, which he said comprises the three great original and constituent orders of every civilized society, landlords, capitalists, and laborers, who respectively earn rent, profit, and wages. Ricardo introduces his favorite theory, labor theory of value, as an approximation to these flows in value terms. So Ricardo takes up the theory of natural price and attempts to develop and defend it. Very roughly, the idea is that the natural and therefore equilibrium price of labor is the proportion of the annual amount of labor directed to the support of the laborers. This is how wages are determined. And so starting from this account of the determination of wages, Ricardo thinks he can construct uh, a theory of rents and therefore a theory of total price. So here is Ricardo. 
Uh, the exchangeable value of all commodities rises as the difficulty of their production increases. If then new difficulties arise, occur sorry, in the production of corn from more labor being necessary, whilst no more labor is required to produce gold, silver, linen, etc., the exchangeable value of corn will necessarily rise as compared with those things. The sole effect then on the progress of wealth and prices appears to be to raise the prices of raw materials and labor and to lower general profits in consequence of the general rise in wages. Ricardo later seems to affirm a theory that makes natural price a direct function of labor time. The principle, he says, that the quantity of labor bestowed on the production of commodities regulates their va relative value considerably modified by the employment of machinery and other fixed and durable capital. Now, this latter statement, especially the considerably modified notion, has puzzled commentators for decades. Um, what does considerably modified mean? In his critique of political economy, Marx will seek to provide a logically consistent answer to this question. Uh, especially in Volume 3 of Capital, he will contrive to produce a a uh, theory of distribution based on a theory of value. But whether we can come up with a consistent theory of distribution or not, an important corollary of the Ricardian theory is that when wages increase, the prices of produced commodities will not increase. Other things equal. Instead, total profit will fall. So, contrary to Smith's political economy, the interests of the laboring so-called and capitalist classes are not in harmony. They are in constant conflict. So Ricardo effectively discovered the class struggle, the class struggle in nascent form. It was up to Marx to make transparent both the significance of this discovery and give it a new conceptual framework, but also to explain how political economy managed to conceal that discovery from itself for so long. This is why, for example, Marx thinks that he can present his critique of political economy as an imminent critique. He thinks if you start from the world of equality and the freedom of classical political economy, you will eventually end up in a world of unfreedom and inequality. Uh, all you need to do is um, rethink the categories. And that's what he will set out to do in, the, uh, in his later writings. So in the next session, what uh, we will do is pick up from where this lecture started, namely uh, from the beginnings of Marx's social thought and his account of alienation and human flourishing. And starting from there, I hope you will come to see that there's a, a continuous strand going through Marx's writings, which effectively has to do with um, an account of, a normative account, self-realization and freedom. Uh, in preparing for, next, for the next lecture on the politics of human flourishing, I would suggest you read the manuscripts on uh, estranged labor and on private property and communism, uh, as well as Marx's comments on James Mill. Till next time.